Thank you for that beautiful welcome. So I'm Pastor Lori. This is Pastor Jason, and we are so excited to be here. Can I just give you a word of encouragement today? Wasn't that a powerful time of worship? I hope God spoke to you. And I loved Pastor Andreas's word that he talked about, about the lion. Is there anybody that's carrying a circumstance, a, a, a heavy circumstance? Maybe you're believing for a healing. Maybe there's someone in your life, a relationship that needs restoration. Maybe you need freedom. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction. Is there a mountain of a circumstance that you're facing? Just wave at me. God knows. Just wave at me that you're praying into. You know, as we have been touring through your beautiful city and landscape here, the nature of God, the nature of God and his character shows up in his creation, right? It's why it's literally called his nature. And as we were driving through the mountains, honestly, we don't have mountains in Ontario, so I'm pretty sure we might be looking at houses this afternoon to... Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, oh, I, oh I, I was going to say we have mountains of problems in Ontario. <laughs> yes, we do. We absolutely do. In particular do. in Ottawa, but yes, that's a different yes. story we're not going to talk about today. <laughs> But as we were driving through the mountains, you know, the mountains literally speak of the magnitude of God, of his strength, of his might, of his absolute awe, of his absolute awe. I put my feet in the Pacific Ocean. It was on my bu summer bucket list. I need to put my feet in the ocean. And listen, we we're nowhere near the ocean where we are. Put my feet in the Pacific Ocean. And as you look at the ocean, again, it speaks of the nature of God, of the vastness and, you know, the enemy, what he wants to do is he wants to take our circumstances. I mean, he did it right in the garden. He said, do you want to be like God? So he takes our circumstance and he says, your circumstance is the mountain. And all of a sudden, all we see right in front of us is this mountain of a circumstance that's right in front of us. And we can't see anything else. And honestly, church, what I encourage you to do today, if you are facing a mountain of a circumstance, just look up. Just look up and see the nature and the greatness and the magnitude of our God. Church, anything is possible. Anything is possible. And God wants to change your perspective on your circumstance today. He wants you to just look up and see his greatness and see the awe in his nature and his character. And remember that you are not alone. As, as literally that magnitude makes you feel small, remember that you are not alone. He, that great God, is with you, is in you. And so you can walk through anything. You can walk through anything. We're going to be praying for you, and we're going to be praying for that breakthrough because God wants to break through in your circumstance. I'm just going to take one second and just introduce us because I know when a guest speaker comes, I don't know if you're like me, but I'm really curious about them. I just want to know a little bit about their life. So I'll share a little bit about us. Uh, we've been married for 27 years. We have four kids. We have two boys aged 22 and 20. They're back at home in Ottawa. And then our two girls are with us here. And that is Emma and Allie, and they are 18 and 17. So I had four kids in five years. We've been married 27 years, and we've been in ministry serving faithfully at Life Center for about 25 of those years. And about 15 years ago, um, our church was founded by Jason's parents. It's about 41 years old. And so about 15 years ago, um, Jason and his father did a succession plan, and uh, Jason became the lead pastor of the church. And since then, um, we were a one-site church at that time. God has placed it on our hearts to begin to grow campuses because part of our mission and our call that we feel like God has called us to is growing people. Our mission is growing people with Jesus and others. And so we, as a part of that mission, we felt that um, God was going to open up the door to revitalize churches. So again, we've had all kinds of different sort of partnerships and scenarios of our campuses. We have a campus in the west end of our city, one in the east end of our city, and one about an hour outside of our city. And so we have three campuses that call Life Center home. We are called One Church in Three Locations, and it is absolutely extraordinary honor to lead this ministry together. Uh, Jason and I now co-lead Life Center together. Um, I've played many, many roles over the years, everything from running mom's groups while I was at home with the kids to our um, campus pastor of our, our main 
campus to now co-leading together. And it is such an honor to be able to minister together and to serve together. And we are so excited to be here, so excited to have met um, Ermory and Andreas and knew right from the very beginning, actually right from literally the first email, I, I, she, she sent me an email. She said, this is going to sound crazy. You're going to think I'm crazy. But your church, your church name, we want to change your name. We have a similar logo in mind. Like we have a heart logo to Life Church. We only visit Life Church churches because we're life center. No, we, <laughs> but we knew that there was going to be something special that God had for us. And so it's been so wonderful to get to know both of you and just to be here today is like a dream come true. So thank you for welcoming us. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, well, like Laura was saying that we want to take a moment and honor, honor both of you, Pastors Andreas and Ermery. We want to honor this house and bless this house. I don't know if you feel it, but every single Sunday, the invisible church all over the world, whether it is in a cathedral, whether it's in an environment like this or a home, the invisible church of God becomes visible. Salt and light that is scattered becomes gathered, and it's a significant part of how God moves in a nation and in a community. And so I want to thank you for saying yes to the call of God, the ongoing call of God in your life. And on behalf of Lori and I, we honor and we bless you both today. Church, do you understand how blessed you are? Not just from them, but of course, your entire pastoral staff, but you are absolutely blessed. And of course, personally, Lori and I also want to say thank you to Yvonne and David for your extraordinary generosity. Uh, we are absolutely humbled. You ready to dig in for a minute? That was a question. Like, are you ready? I do talk back a little bit, okay? So you, know, you, you have to work. Now, I know I'm new, and I know that you're new, so let's just check each other out, okay? So I'm going to do a twirl, and you can check me out, okay? And it, you don't do a twirl. You just sit right there, and it's going to be absolutely fine. Well, in 2018, 2019, I took a trip to Israel. We took a trip to Israel, and... Uh, we had an opportunity to go to Gethsemane, which is a quite a significant, weighty place. And what preceded us going to Israel was a really painful season that the circumstances are too long to get into in this moment, but it was a profoundly painful season. And in that painful season, um, we went to Gethsemane, and it's, it's, it's an olive grove full of olive trees, and it is spectacularly beautiful. It is different in beauty, but equally beautiful to what you see all around you each day. And they gave us an opportunity just to go pray in Gethsemane for about an hour. And so uh, there's beautiful, beautiful olive trees. And as I was walking through Gethsemane, how many of you know that sometimes in life you just have to be close to something on the outside that represents how you feel on the inside? And so for me, I just found this olive tree that had been basically broken in half. All it was was a stump, literally out in this beauty in Gethsemane, a stump. You know, it was the least beautiful tree in the garden, but somehow I felt by God to go there. And I didn't feel any emotion. I just kind of chased a whisper of the spirit. I sat down by this olive tree. And again, gone through a painful season, it represented, it was a good visual picture of just how I felt broken on the inside. And I sat down on the tree and I, and I felt the Lord ask me to do something. And I reached into my pocket to take out one of the coins that I had and just basically place it inside, like deep inside the tree, to which I did. Um, and I placed it deep inside the tree, and as I did, I just felt this beautiful whisper of the Lord to my heart, which was this, if you will trust me, I can do valuable things with broken people. And it was just this profound moment. It wasn't for anybody else. It was for me, and I began to weep from my toes out. Toes out. Someone actually captured a picture of it, and uh, they sent it to me, which was profoundly, profoundly beautiful. Uh, quick side note, then I'm going to jump back in. A couple years later, my father went back to Israel. My parents went back to Israel. They led a group, and he went to the same tree. And this is amazing. The, the coin wasn't there. Someone stole it. Thief. <laughs> but you know what's incredible? And I don't know why, but inside the tree, the coin was gone, but somebody had placed a key on the inside of it. Those of you who are prophetic, maybe you can figure that out. I have no clue what it meant. I just thought it was pretty cool. But Scott Saul says this, that beautiful people don't just happen. But when they do happen, even a wheelchair can become a pulpit. A chemo room, a place of worship. Chronic pain, a path to holiness. Burial dirt, a plot of resurrection soil. And a death and death, a festival on the road to freedom. 
And the road to freedom, however, is often found on the other side of your yes, of your obedience, of where God is leading you. Whether you are here or whether you are at home today, one of the things that we all have in common is I am absolutely certain of this one thing. God is moving and he is active and he is present in every single one of our stories. Some of us are aware of it, some of us are tuned to it, others of us are ignorant of it, but God is moving in every single story. If you are a grandmother or a grandfather, a mom or a dad, an uncle or an aunt, a coworker or a boss, I promise you that God is working in the lives of everyone in your sphere. They just may not know where he is working. But the road to freedom, again, for us is found on the other side of often where God is leading us. And today, my heart is to help us focus on how Jesus may be leading you, but I know that he is most certainly leading the capital C church through a season of transition. And loved ones, this is a vital transition that we get. I personally learned about the power of transition studying the work of Dr. Robert Clinton, but also a mentor of mine, Terry Walling. Because how you process seasons of change and seasons of transition, how you process them, will either lead to transformation or it'll lead to a tragedy. And when I say a tragedy, I'm not talking about maybe just in the epic scale of it, But what is tragic is a life that doesn't reach the full potential that God has purposed for it. That is ultimately tragic. God is good and he is gracious and he is loving and he is kind, yes. And we celebrate that nature and character of God as Pastor Lori was saying. But God also has a purpose and a plan and a destiny. There are people in your sphere that God will use your life to make a Jesus-sized difference in their life. And your yes or your no, it matters. It's not just for elite Christians. There aren't any, by the way. There are fellow sojourners. It's not just for paid staff. It is the priesthood of every single one of us, the body of Christ. God has given spiritual gifts to every single one of us so that the body would be what it's called to be for the city of Ladner or Delta, British Columbia. I don't know if you've known, but we as a whole world have gone through a little thing called the pandemic that has not been problematic at all. We have gone through this without issue. God be the glory. Great things he has done. We are collectively living through a season of bliss and harmony without any conflict or division. Some of you are saying, where where do you live? Ottawa. Did I not tell you that's where I'm from? That's not what it's like here? Oh, (laughs) Due to the pandemic, though, we are collectively living through a season of global transition, and these are unique in history. They don't happen often. So a little bit more about how God uses transitions. Over the course of our lives, every one of us will go through between six to 10, maybe even 12 of them, but the big three are in your teens and 20s. You need, to be get a hold, you need to get honed in and get a hold of, God, what have you called me to do? What's the path? What's the direction? It may not be absolutely narrowed, but I know I'm going this way. This is a transition that God will lead you if in your teens, 20s, and 30s, we've got to give us that one part of it. If you're maybe in your 40s and 50s or 30s, 30s and 40s, excuse me, there is this path of convergence where of all the things that I could do, God, what would you have me do in this season? And then maybe in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s, it's known as the season of finishing. I'm not saying you're finished. Please don't hear that. Retirement is not in the scriptures. Amen? From the moment you start breathing air until you breathe your last, you are purposeful and needed in the body of Christ. Now, retirement is a cultural world. It's a beautiful thing. It's a season of transition, but it's an important season to say, God, if everything that you have given me to steward, how do I pass it to the next generation? Because every single one of us wants to live a life, not just where we hit a level, but where the next generation can begin to build where we ended so that they can build greater for the next generation. This is the heart of being a follower of Jesus. It's the heart of a church. And transitions are these in-between times where God is taking you from where you are. Everyone say, from where you are. From where you are to where you need to be for what he desires to do next in your life. Sometimes in life, all you need is a small transition. Anybody here ever have a bad attitude? Can I see your hands, please? Anybody here have a bad attitude listening to me speaking right now? The first, thank you for your honesty. The first, I love you. You are my, now my new best friend. 
The first question, however, though, was a group participation question. The second question was an IQ question, and you passed with flying colors. It's awesome. Sometimes, though, we just need a little attitude adjustment, a perspective shift, or a different choice to be made, but sometimes we need a paradigm shift. We need something that is larger to, for God to expand the horizon for what we can see, that we go through sizable transitions when, again, God moves us from where we are to where we need to be next to walk in where he's requiring obedience. And transitions have unique symptoms. If you're in a transition, they, they have a, they're accompanied by prolonged seasons of restlessness. You begin to experience maybe even self-doubt, diminished confidence, a lack of direction, a sense of God, I don't know what is going on in this moment. Perhaps you may even feel distant from God. Isn't it remarkable that the God of the universe who is everywhere can still hide? He says, seek me with all of your heart and you'll find me. It's this unique characteristic of God and even a lack of effectiveness. What once worked no longer seems to work. We at Life Center have gone through transitions where everything that we do in ministry that was good in one season is ineffective in another season. God begins to lead into a season of change where it's not as though it was bad and it needs to be dishonored. It is just he's leading us to do something different. The defining symptom of a, a transition is that you've been in it for a prolonged period of time. Not just a bad week or a bad month. I'm not talking about that. Usually you are knee deep into a transition before you know you've even stepped into one. You don't see it on the front end. You begin to recognize it when you're already knee deep. Like, oh no, this might be different. Because sometimes, loved ones, God dulls a dream to awaken a different desire for something different or deeper in him. Think about the disciples for three and a half years, they walked with Jesus and any time they desired, they could turn to him and say, what did you mean by that? Let's talk about that. Let's have a conversation. And then he dies and he rises again. And at the ascension, he is now in heaven. How many of you know that they are going through a transition? That God who was right there is now no longer where they can see, but everything that he has deposited in them is still there. Yet in the, in the ascension, God begins to speak to the disciples differently. They could hear the voice of Jesus. Now when they begin to pray, it's a little bit more silence. But silence is another way that God speaks. It's just different from what they were used to. And then comes the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And where God was in the person of Jesus speaking to the disciples, now he fills 120 in the upper room and they go from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and even to Ladner, British Columbia. Every single one of us can trace coming to Christ through their faithfulness and their obedience. Aren't you glad that God had designed something different and deeper for the disciples to experience other than just God for three and a half years in one location and then it was over? But yet it required, we are the recipients of their obedience, but they had to walk through a very difficult transition. Really profoundly difficult. They had to walk through, God, I'm not quite so sure this is better. I liked it better when you were right here. And Jesus would say to them, I have sent my spirit. It's not just that I am right here, I am right here. Yeah, but I like this better. Sometimes you got to let go of this better to get where God is going. As followers of Jesus, our greatest need in times of transition is voice recognition. Whose voice are we going to listen to? One thing that is true in this time and in this season is it has never been more noisy for the people of God. How many people do you follow on social media? Don't look at it through the lens of only influence. Look at it also through the lens of how many voices am I going to let into my life? Whether it is social media or traditional media, how many voices, we need a pantheon of voices, but how many can I steward well? God, here's the question I ask with anything related to that. God, how many voices do I need to be present in my life? 
and can I still hear you? And when I can no longer hear you, it is often not that he isn't speaking. It is simply I have let too many voices in. It's not that God isn't speaking. It's I can no longer discern what it is he's saying. So the question is and isn't, should I be on? The personal question is, how am I stewarding that? How am I hearing God's voice? In this picture, in what I'm reading online and I get with my brothers and sisters, does it cause me to love them more? Or when they walk in the door and they say something different, does my heart immediately go, can I listen and hear how God may be speaking to them, though I may vehemently disagree? These are places where God is leading his church. Let's go back again to the disciples learning how to listen and learn and obey and walk and try again. One day, Jesus tells them three agricultural parables of sowing and weeds and mustard seeds. Oh, that rhymed. I didn't even plan it, and it rhymed. (laughs) T.D. Jakes, eat your heart out. Each parable contains elements of transition, tragedy, and transformation. Let's read in Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30. He put another parable before them saying, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed. Everyone say good seed. If you're online, you better be typing good seed right now in the chat. Good seed. Who sowed good seed in his field. And while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat. Sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore again, Then the weeds also appeared. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, an enemy. Everyone say an enemy. An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, then do you want us to go and gather them? Here's the thing. Do you want us to go and try to separate in our own wisdom, in our own strength, in our own intellect, do you want us to be the arbiter of where you're moving and where you're not? Do you want us to separate weed from wheat? But he said, no, 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 no. I added a few more no's there, by the way. <laughs> Least in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Oh, oh. We want clean cuts, man. In or out. On my side or not? Yet oftentimes in times of transition, we begin to go through this temptation to do in our strength what only God can do. That we want to weed, we want to clean, we want to, yet it is the work of God in our hearts and lives. Yes, in a global sense, he's talking to this, but also in a personal sense. So no, at least in gathering the weeds, you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, later in the same chapter, Jesus explains the precise meaning of this parable, so you do not need me to explain it. Quick nutshell, the field is the world. The good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The bad seeds is the the sons of the evil one. And at the end of the age, Jesus will separate. Everyone say, Jesus will separate. Jesus will separate. Not me, not you. Not us. Look around. We're doing a terrible job at it. Jesus will separate all causes of sin and lawbreakers. And so what is the warning that Jesus years earlier, or perhaps a season earlier, I should say, what is the warning that Jesus is telling his disciples? What he is encouraging them to do is both trust the work of Christ, trust the work of the Spirit, trust what I am doing. But he's also saying in times where you're looking at a field and you're seeing both the work of the God and the work of the enemy present, be cautious. Here's what not to do. Don't try to separate it in your own strength. Now fast forward a little bit to the book of Acts and these same disciples who in the upper room who were filled with the Holy Spirit, who are going through a transition, you know what they need to begin to figure out? What are Jewish customs and Gentile customs? How come the same Holy Spirit who has, or the same God who's exclusively been a Jewish story now is beginning to graft in Gentile story? They have to work through later 
What does this church look like? But God began to prepare them in an earlier season so that they can go through a transition so that the church that we're a part of could actually grow and thrive. They could not be ready in this season unless God took them through this season. You can't be ready for the next season. You cannot be faithful to steward what God has not yet put into your hands. You can only be faithful in the season that you find yourself in. The direction Jesus was leading the disciples was a different and a deeper work of trust. Look through church history and you will see both beautiful transformation, but you will also see painful tragedy where we as the church have fallen short. Oh, I am thankful for God's grace. I am thankful for God's mercy. I am thankful for his kindness. But if your heart does not break at the injustice at the hands of those of us who claim the name of God, then you are not breathing in this season, nor are you listening. Loved ones, when the world holds up a mirror to the church, may we have the courage not to criticize the one that is holding the mirror, but may we have the courage to look at the picture of what is being held up and say, God, God, would you do something new in our midst so that they can see you differently than they do today? Throughout church history, again, we can see this, this, this amazing way in which God uses the church, and then sometimes, sometimes we get it woefully wrong. Here's what is true of each of us, if we're honest. If you're an honest follower of Jesus, here's what it's true. God's direction is first to whom, and then it is secondly, to what? Some of you are struggling to find your purpose because all you're asking are what questions. Here's what I promise you. If you become a master and you discipline yourself in being obedient to follow Jesus, I promise you, you will walk in the what. But if you get your eyes fixed exclusively on the what, and not on the whom, you will find yourself frustrated. Is it any wonder why we have more books on purpose in the church today, but equal amounts of frustration within the church today? Loved ones, it's a whom first before it is a what. Watch how the Apostle Paul taught this to the church in Ephesus. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. Everyone say, in Christ Jesus for good works, first whom, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's the what. They are good works in Christ Jesus is whom, then the what. So notice the essential word, however, there is that we should walk in them, which means that we don't always walk in them. And why don't we walk in them? Because we're terrible and bad? Well, no, those are people who go to other churches, not you. (laughs) No, I'm not saying that. But we live in contested space. Have you noticed this? Have you noticed the voice of God is not the only voice present in your life? The voice of Jesus is not the only voice in our lives. In the parable we just read, both God and the enemy are present in the same field. How many of you know the enemies at work in your family? Some of you are like, you don't need to tell me that. <laughs> I, you got time? I know. So there's God's voice, there's the enemy's voice, there's the voices we let in, and then there's our own thoughts and feelings. And so if God's direction is different and deeper in him, towards what? Well, how does the enemy lead? In transition, our enemy desires to lead us in the direction of distraction, of division, and of destruction. A word of caution to the Canadian church, though I am uniquely unqualified to give it. Here is what I would say. We may be experiencing polarization and division, but unless we humble our hearts and fall on our knees together, loved ones, it gets worse. 
Because division is not the end goal of the enemy. It is just another step on the way to destruction. Rob and kill, is, or rob and steal is terrible, but kill and destroy is more profound in its destruction. This is what the enemy desires to do. And so just pause with me as I do begin to wrap up. I am going to stop talking. Pause with me. As Christians, can you imagine with me, just, just with your sanctified imagination, could you imagine with me today on this Sunday and can you imagine what could have been and what could still be if with all of our varying, perhaps, pandemic perspectives, if we chose to honor difference and be led deeper into trust and different from how the world is navigating it, could you imagine, could God be leading his church into a profound season of revealing how we do not love one another well? and how we are called to love one another. And if we can get this well, not perfectly, but puberty, if we can get this well, if we can get this well and we can do this well, Jesus said, then the world will know that you are following someone who's different. And so could it be in this season of polarization that we find ourselves going through that there is not only the demonic present and the enemy present, though I know he is fully present, absolutely. And could it also not be that it's not our thoughts and not just our opinions? Can the Holy Spirit be working powerfully in this season to prune his church? to do something in our hearts and lives, to cut back. We may be in, hey, loved ones, we may be in an ugly season of the church, but we're still the church rooted in Jesus that can actually expand deeper. Here's all I know. Whenever God is preparing to move deeper or different in your life or expand your influence, he will first begin to quarry you deeper so that your roots go deeper so that you can sustain what it is that he is about to do. And this is something that I believe with my whole heart is happening in the church. I mean, think of the plenty of stories. Oh, I love when the keys just come in. It makes me feel so encouraged. <laughs> you are the wind. That's what I always want to sing. Beneath my fly. Every time the keys come in, doesn't matter where I'm preaching, that's all the Bette Midler. It's all that comes into my head. It's powerful, though. So think of the plenty of stories. Why did we talk about that? Why did you talk about that? I don't know. Think of the plenty of stories that Jesus tells in the Gospels. Sheep and goats and broad and narrow roads, wise and foolish builders, wheats and tares. The single element, the single common element is this. God knows who are his. He notices what we do. And here's the deeper. God knows why you do what you do. Oh, you can fool me and I can fool you. But you can't fool God. which is why separation is God's space alone. The warning from Jesus is again, I, I don't always know whose are his and I don't know why you do what you do, but I can trust that he does. And so I want you to think about biblical characters that you know, Joseph, he grows from dream to destiny by going through transitions. And David grows from anointing to authority wildly imperfectly by growing through transitions. And Esther grows from reluctance to reigning by growing through a transition. And Ruth grows from the temptation of bitterness to redemption by going through a transition. The church of Jesus Christ is birthed from Jewish to Gentile by going through a transition. And Samson, he doesn't grow from gifting to character. And so his story is ultimately what God did, but it's tragic in the sense of what he didn't do. And King Saul in the Old Testament doesn't grow from obedience, for he, he doesn't grow from obedience, from disobedience to obedience, excuse me. And so his story is tragic. If you don't say yes to what God is doing, life goes on, but you have arrested development. There's plenty of people who chronologically grow older, but they never grow up. 
There are plenty of Christians who accurate, they, they accrue years in church, but not the spiritual maturity that God designs. And each and every one of us and them are led by God in descent and seasons of transition. So two questions. Lord, what are you doing in my life? Lord, where are you active? How do I understand then and align to what you are doing in my life? These are profound questions. As individuals and as the Capital C Church imperfectly navigates the season we're in, there's a promise that we can hold on to. John 10, four to five. When he had brought out his, all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee for they do not know the voice of strangers. Sitting in Gethsemane, I could remain in my brokenness or I could, have tr or I could trust God to embrace that he, can, he alone could bring value from this season of brokenness. I don't subscribe to faith that denies reality. I subscribe to a faith in Christ that he holds the ultimate truth. I don't have to deny the mess of what is because I know the one who can do all things in the midst of whatever it is that I'm facing. Life Church, thank you for the honor of listening to me for a few minutes. My heart and prayer is that at some point you didn't hear this moron, but that the Holy Spirit spoke to your heart. Just something. You are a generous, you are a kind, and you are a powerful church that this region needs. And like every church, we've already wasted too much time in fighting. Each other, we're not the enemy. Let's unite around the one that is common. And let's together, let's together, in the power of the Spirit, do damage to his kingdom so that God's kingdom of light that is needed in this region would be evident to all, here or at home. If you become even a fraction more like Jesus, then today is a good day. I bless and honor your pastors and your leaders and the work of Christ in this house, in this region. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, whether it is for the first time or a fresh time, speak to our hearts and change our lives. Less of us and more of you. Bring us to our knees. Break what you need to break so that may we walk, may we may walk in everything that you have prepared in advance and purposed us to walk in. I bless this house with every spiritual blessing. May you prosper and thrive and establish the work of their hands in this region that profoundly needs Jesus. Maybe not as much as Ottawa, but nonetheless needs him the same. Amen.